much. You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. In the later months of 1995, 28-year-old Jane Mansfield found herself in need of an obstetrician. She was pregnant with her first baby, and as most first-time mums do, she put her trust in the medical professional that her GP had referred her to, a doctor named Graham Reeves at the Hills Hospital in Sydney's Balcom Hills. Throughout her pregnancy care, Jane felt there was something not quite right about her doctor, But it wasn't anything specific, nothing she could really put a finger on. And as far as she knew, she was receiving expert care. Who was she to question the methods of a doctor with the relevant qualifications and over a decade of experience? In 1996, Jane delivered her bouncing baby boy, and the unnerving memories of her obstetrician's strange behaviours quickly disappeared in the busy haze of new parenthood. It would be years before she saw his face again. This time, it was on the TV, during the news. The words, the butcher of Bega, emblazoned under his image. I'm Claire Murphy, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In last week's episode, we examined the crimes of former New South Wales gynaecologist and obstetrician Graham Reeves, unpacking the allegations that landed him in the headlines and eventually behind bars. Today, we're joined by Jane Mansfield, a former patient of Dr Reeves, telling her story for the first time. And just before you hear from Jane, please be aware that this conversation does discuss sexual assault, so please take care when listening. She joins us now. So, Jane, can you take me back to the beginning of your story with Graham Reeves? Were you referred to him by a GP or was it word of mouth? How did you come into contact with him to start with? I'd been travelling, backpacking overseas and fallen pregnant. And by the time I got home, I was six and a half months pregnant and desperately needing prenatal care. So I went to my local GP and Graham Reeves appeared to be the private gynaecologist because I was privately health covered. He appeared to be the doctor that you would get referred to. So I don't know whether they had a list of gynaecologists or whatever, but his name was the one that was offered to me and that was the one I followed through because I was desperate to get in and get some sort of care happening before the baby was born and lots of planning goes into that. So, yeah, it was really important to find a good gynaecologist and that's what I thought I was getting. Now, you would presume that if you're referred to someone by your GP that that person is good at what they do, that yeah. they've been referred to that GP as somebody who can be trusted. Yeah. And obviously this is in the days pre-Google, yep. so you can't really look this doctor up. No. Did you have any feedback from anybody around you, whether it be from a doctor or from somebody else who might have used him as a gynecologist, as to what type of doctor he was? No. So my expectation was that I was going to see an obstetrician and he was going to nurse me through to giving birth to my baby and we move on, right? But when it came to being referred to him, there was nobody that I could refer to and go and ask about his bona fide credentials or any of that kind of thing. It was just a matter of trust. So I had no preconceived idea of who he was or what his personality was or or any kind of information about him apart from the fact that he was going to help bring this baby into the world and I was putting my trust in him and was quite comfortable with it at that point. So you're at a point where you're pretty desperate for care, Mm -hmm. six and a half months along, which means things are about to get pretty serious pretty fast. You go and see Dr. Reeves. What was your initial consultation with him like? Okay, so whenever I go and see a doctor, I actually appreciate a really straightforward doctor. I don't like anyone that's too gentle or sort of reserved. I I do appreciate 
a doctor that kind of takes charge and seems to know what they're doing. And he really did seem to have that kind of personality. So when I walked in the room, he was a little bit gruff, but, you know, I thought, well, you know, I need someone to take control of this pregnancy now because, you know, I'm not going to be able to do it on my own from this part forward. And I really got a sense that he knew what he was talking about and what he was doing and I was in good hands. And there was no signs even in that first appointment that would have sent any red flags up for me. So you get past that initial consultation, you're feeling pretty confident. When during your prenatal care did you start to realise that maybe things weren't quite right with Dr Reeves? I didn't have any girlfriends that had gone through a pregnancy. So I was the first girlfriend in my group of friends that had a baby. So I had no one that I could go and ask questions to. You know, it was a first pregnancy, so I didn't know what I was going to be experiencing or or anything. But I started to feel really uneasy when I went to see him in his rooms and to the point that I actually asked my husband's mother to come to appointments with me because it just felt wrong. So he gave me an internal exam every time I went to see him. And I know after subsequent babies that's not normal. And, yeah, he used to put the speculum in really roughly and it used to be quite painful. And I put the pain down to probably the baby or he'd say to me I wasn't lying in the right position or whatever. But, yeah, I just got this sense that that wasn't normal and I felt really uncomfortable with him when I was alone with him in the rooms. Nothing happened. I just had this sense of feeling really uncomfortable with him and to the point where I got my mother-in-law to come and come to my appointments and she would be in the room every appointment until I gave birth to my son. Yeah, and that would have been at about from about eight months onwards. Hmm. Did he ever give you an explanation as to why an internal exam was required for you at every appointment? Checking my cervix, just making sure that the baby's, you know, was in the right position because he'd check internally and have his hand on my belly and be fiddling around and moving his hand around in there and stuff. So, you know, I didn't really get an appreciation for that being wrong, but it didn't feel right. So, and I didn't know to ask questions like, yeah, I mean, I was 28 at that point and, yeah, I guess... When you go to a doctor like that, you put them on a pedestal. You don't mean to, but you're introduced to them as somebody that's going to take charge, take control. They know what they're doing. And so you put a lot of power in their hands when they're looking after you to make sure that you're doing everything you need to do to make this baby healthy and come out right at the right time. So, yeah, I had no idea what he was doing was wrong, but it didn't feel right. And what was his demeanour like with you? during those appointments. You said at the beginning you liked a sort of no-nonsense doctor, but did his demeanour ever make you start to d- question whether he was doing the right thing? I just started feeling like he was just not a very nice person, like he was always in a bad mood, right, or he's gruff, dishevelled a bit too, so he always looked a little bit scruffy and he had this kind of facial hair, like he just, he looked unkempt, I guess. But, you know, then I just put that down to him just working really hard. And, you know, I mean, you can put a lot of reasons into your head to make things fit a certain narrative and make yourself feel comfortable about something. But yeah, I definitely didn't feel comfortable with him. Yeah, towards the end of the pregnancy. So yeah. And my mother-in-law would ask questions as well, just, you know, just a little sort of question here and there. And he used to get quite annoyed because she wasn't his patient, I was. So it was kind of like, you know, Jane will be fine, you know, I'm taking, you know, this will be all blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I ended up making the choice to have Liam early because he would said to me that he was worried that I was going to get preeclampsia. But later on I found out why he wanted to make the birth early and that was because he was going on holidays. So there was never any signs or symptoms that you were suffering from preeclampsia? No, no. But I was big. All my pregnancies were large. My second baby was like a lot bigger than Liam and Liam was born at 3.8 kilos. And so I was quite large. I was very uncomfortable with the pregnancy towards the end. But, you know, it was January, Christmas, you know, so that time of the year is really hot and so it's uncomfortable anyway. But, yeah, he was quite keen to just say, well, okay, we can put you in hospital. We'll 
get New Year's out of the way and, you know, you can have him a little bit earlier and then, you know, and then we'll just make sure that your blood pressure and everything's fine. And he said, you know, it should be an easy birth and it'll all work out. So, yeah, I booked in and I just had him induced. When you said your mother-in-law started to accompany you to these appointments, did she find out then that other people were also not feeling so comfortable with Dr Reeves at that time? Yeah, because when I was allocated him as an obstetrician or referred to him, I get the impression there wasn't a lot of obstetricians around in the Hills District at that particular time. And my mother-in-law's best friend, her daughter also saw Graham Reeves. And yeah, her daughter had exactly the same story as I do and that he was giving her internal exams. She didn't feel comfortable. After I started getting Peter's mum, Faye, to come with me, then Jane got her mother, Nesley, to go in with her too. And it just became this thing between the four of us that, you know, we just didn't want any sort of like time in his rooms alone with him. We just didn't feel comfortable. Yeah. Just didn't feel right, you know. I mean, I look back at it now and I get a real sense that I was, yeah, sexually assaulted. And with subsequent pregnancies, I learned that a lot of those exams were completely unnecessary. And, yeah, and he was very rough with me. Even during the birth, he was rough. So I just got a sense that he was just not a very nice person, yeah. And I had no reason to call him that. It's just I never felt comfortable with him and his mood never, ever and there was no levity to him at all. He was always just very gruff and hurried and you were a problem or you were costing him time or whatever. Yeah, so. What sense did you get from the people who worked around Dr Reeves in his rooms? Did the nurses ever make you feel like they too were concerned or were they complicit in what he was doing? So there was no nurse in the room. So often now when you go and see a gynaecologist, there'll be a second person, like a nurse in the room. But Back then, no, it was just him and me and then ultimately my mother-in-law. And the nurse or the the staff that were at his rooms was his wife. So she used to run the phone. So, yeah. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Claire Murphy. I'm speaking with Jane Mansfield, a former patient of gynaecologist and obstetrician Graham Reeves better known as the Butcher of Bega. So he decides that he wants to induce you early. How early are we talking? Two weeks. So you're at 38 weeks. Yeah. You go into hospital to be induced. Yeah. Talk me through the actual birth of Liam. Was that a traumatic experience for you? Extremely, yeah. So I had no idea what induction would entail and I've had induction with my second son, which was a completely different experience. But this first time I was given oxytocin gel, so they put that up inside the vagina and it helps make the cervix dilate, but it happens over a number of hours. So they put in the gel and it can take a long time. It can take hours for that gel to actually sort of start working. And they gave me an infusion of something else. I'm not quite sure what they gave me, but it may have been Sintosin actually that they gave me to help bring it on. But it took hours. So, you know, walking around the hospital, walking around the room, just trying to get things moving and all of that. So really I it was hours, probably eight hours of me going through that before Liam actually started coming into the birth canal. And they didn't call Dr Reeves until that cervix had dilated to a certain point. But prior to that, I'd, in part of my birth plan, I'd asked that I have a epidural and the guy giving the epidural just wasn't doing it in the right place so it wasn't really working properly. And they topped me up for pain just before Graham Reeves was called. But the timing of that epidural was really bad because it meant that that epidural started taking effect when the doctor was coming in and requiring me to push and do all those things that I needed to do to get Liam out. So when Graham Reeves turned up, I was wreathing on the bed because the epidurals hadn't worked properly and screaming and cursing. And he said, oh, for God's sake, just put the mask on her mouth and get her to shut up. I'm here now. 
you can stop screaming, Jane. You're only giving birth to a baby. Women do it all over the world, you know. It'll be fine. You don't have anything to worry about. And, yeah, and then he just proceeded to roll up his sleeves and, yeah, start the process of trying to deliver lamb. Yeah. So it was, it was really traumatic because I had never had a baby before. So, you know, when you're induced, often it comes on harder. So it's not like a gentle kind of transition into birthing. It's quite, it comes on quite hard and fast and it's really a lot more intense. And I didn't know what to expect. It was my first baby. He was a big baby. And yeah, the epidural wasn't working as planned. So, yeah. So it comes time to push. Mm. And the epidural that you'd been topped up with is taking effect mm-hmm. at the worst possible moment. Yeah. What was it like to actually get Liam out? So he was pulling me around, positioning me, because I couldn't do it myself properly, and quite rough with me. And just basically, just, yeah, it's just sort of saying, you know, you need to do this, Jane, come on breathe more of the gas, you know, stop panicking, it's all going to happen, it's all fine, you need to push now. And I'm saying, well, the epidural hasn't worked properly and now it's starting to work. He's going, you've almost given birth to this baby, Jane, we need to get him out now. And anyway, he then turned around and said, oh, don't worry about it, I'm just going to get the forceps and we'll use the forceps. And so they used forceps to deliver him and I had a complete tear as a result. So I tore from front to back as he took Liam out and, yeah, Liam was quite bruised and, yeah, as a result of having had the forceps used and he had a big sort of bruise on his eye and across the top of his head. But when he came out, he was crying and everything was normal about Liam. But Graham Reeves wanted to cut the cord. He didn't even want my husband to cut the cord. Like he sort of interrupted and said, no, you know, it's time to cut the cord and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I want my husband to do it. He said, I don't usually do that, but on this occasion I'll let you do it. And so he let Peter cut the cord and then he said, okay, I'll see you later, Jane. It's all done. He's healthy and, you know, I'll be back in a few days just to check on you. And that was the last I saw of him. But when I say the last I saw of him, beyond the birth and having had Liam, going back on ward and having... No, so Liam was fine. He didn't spend any time in the special nursery or anything. His birth, although traumatic, he came out absolutely fine. But when my milk came in, I had very big breasts at that point and they were lumpy anyway, just normally. But when the milk came in, they were really lumpy. And I was stressing, thinking, oh, my gosh, I've got all these lumps in my breasts and my boobs were really painful and the nurses the nurses knew that this was just, you know, baby blues a couple of days later and they knew that it was milk coming in, but I didn't know that. And they just said, oh, you should call the doctor. You should call Dr. Reeves. You know, if you're really worried about this, you know, we can call him, we can get, get him to come in. And they knew he was on holidays. So I think it was a bit of a joke that they called him in because when he came in, he was pissed off. He was calling me all sorts of names and saying that I was a bad excuse as a woman and didn't I realise that I'd had him called in on his holiday? Well, I didn't even know he was going on holidays. That was the first I knew that he'd gone on holidays and then it kind of dawned on me, oh, he's made me give birth so that he could go away and, yeah. But, yeah, he was just screaming at me, telling me that my boobs are lumpy because it was milk and that, you know, this was ridiculous and thousands of women give birth all over the world and they come through absolutely fine and that I needed to get my shit together because now I had a baby and that, you know, what kind of mother was I going to be if I was panicking at everything. And, yeah, he was just really not a very nice person. (laughs) Yeah. Hmm. How did you cope with that? I mean, yeah. Anyone who's had a baby knows that that is such a vulnerable moment mm. in your life. How did that affect you to be screamed at by the person who was supposed to be guiding you through this? Oh, I was crying. I was like ugly crying, you know, snotty nose, just a mess. And when he, the nurses were outside the room because I could hear them because he was just screaming at me, right? And when he left, I said to the nurses, I said, oh, my God, He's the most nasty person I have ever met, you know. I don't understand why he spoke to me like that. And then there's a whole lot of stuff that went on with conversations with the nurses then that, you know, I have no proof over. But what they said to me was that he had been a very big man 
and he'd been taking uh, duramine, which was a weight loss drug, very similar to speed, you know, pseudoephedrine I think it is. And he just was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde on it. Apparently he was just really hard to deal with. He was addicted to those tablets and they really affected his moods and that's what they said to me. And they said, you know, if you have a real problem with what's happened today, you should let the hospital know and make a complaint, which I did do. But I don't think back then it was a formal complaint. Like I don't remember exactly what process I went through at that point. I just can't remember, to be really clear with you. I may have written something down or I may have just been completely verbal. I just can't really refer back to that time. But, yeah, I was left feeling really let down, yeah. And the nurses, I felt, had been mischievous. Did you get a sense that the nurses were afraid of him? Yeah, afraid of him and quite aware of his behaviour. They were up to mischief when they knew that calling him in would have really pissed him off, which it really did, because he came into the hospital in a flying rage and just really just let go on me. And then when he left the room, you could hear him chastising the nurses, but I'm not aware of what that conversation was. So you could just hear Ray's voice. But, yeah, then the nurse came in afterwards and just said, you know, we're really sorry that he spoke to you like that. You know, he's just really moody and rah, rah, rah. And then, the, Yeah. So that complaint, whether it be verbal or written, was it ever followed up by anyone from the hospital with you? No, no. And in the news probably, I don't know, it was about two or three months later, there was a thing in the news where a lady also under the care of Graham Reeves had got a postpartum infection. So she'd given birth to a baby, got an infection, and he had refused to treat her properly. I don't know whether it was a medication issue or or what it was, but she actually died as a result. And that was, you know, just a couple of months after I gave birth to Liam. And I just really felt like I'd dodged a bit of a bullet because, yeah, his behaviour at that point, you know, I think he got in a whole lot of trouble with the hospital and then he wasn't able to practice or he was definitely sacked, I think, from Hills Hospital or they sort of managed to break contract with him, but, yeah. Do you recall when you first sort of heard about this phrase, the butcher of Bega, and when you put two and two together that that was actually Graham Reeves? Yeah. So it was on the news and just came up and I just felt like this real kind of like pit in my stomach and it's just like, oh, my God, oh, wow. Like, fuck, you know, like he just, yeah, what kind of man does that? to somebody and does it in such a contrived way, yeah. And so when I heard about what was happening down in Bigger, I was just like gobsmacked that after what he did in Sydney and lost a patient that he could actually be down the south coast working, you know, in an area health system that was putting him in the same position that he'd been in. When I got referred to him, those women on on South Coast, they wouldn't have known any different. They would have just thought that they were getting a gynaecologist that came from Sydney and they were lucky to be in his presence, right, and have him look after them. Such a different time for those women who were victims of his later on down the track compared to you in the 1990s where information wasn't available. People could have Googled him and found out the things that he'd been accused of previously. Do you feel like, and I know a lot of people feel the same way, that we have too much of a blind faith in people in the medical profession to question when they do do things that make us feel uncomfortable? Yeah. I mean, we are always taught in society that doctors, you know, they're individuals that we should look up to. The profession itself, you know, is one of kindness and care. And so we just assume when we walk into an office of a doctor that they're going to look after us, that they're in a position that they know what they're doing, they're good at their craft, and you're going to walk out with whatever medical condition you have or service that you require, it's going to get resolved by seeing that doctor. So, yeah, you do put a lot of faith in their ability, but you also put them on a bit of a pedestal, I think. You know, there's a sense of power that you give them because you, you're handing yourself over to them in, and putting yourself in their care. And so that level of trust when things go wrong gets completely broken. Jane, how do you feel about that experience? I know you said you felt like you dodged a bullet, but things did happen to you without your consent. 
throughout that process. And yeah. I know that before we started this conversation, you said it it's such a long time ago, so you have moved on from it. But when you do reflect on that time and the experience that you went through, how does it leave you feeling now all these years later? Well, this is the first time I've ever really publicly spoken about what happened to me. And it's quite obvious just with history that I wasn't the only person that he treated in such a bad way. I haven't ever had counselling over what happened at the time, you know, I had my baby, he was healthy, he needed me, I just clicked into being a mum, being sleep deprived and, you know, just trying to move forward and, you know, and subsequently fell pregnant 20 months later with another baby and quite obviously I didn't go back to Graham Reeves. I found a, another obstetrician who was the complete opposite, very kind, very gentle, very sweet man. And my birth experience that time was just so different. And if only I had had that experience the first time, I think a lot of the trauma that I felt after Reeves, yeah, I would have avoided. He sexually assaulted me and he didn't do it once. He did it numerous times. And I was so innocent that I didn't really appreciate that that's what he was actually doing to me at the time. And that makes me really upset for my younger self that I didn't know that at the time, that that's what he was doing. But there was obviously an innate feeling there that something was not right because I had I got my mother-in-law to come because I felt so uncomfortable. So, yeah, there's a bit of a trauma attached to it, I guess. I mean, I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about it, but, you know, in the last week or so I've thought about it. And, yeah, occasionally it makes me feel a bit teary thinking about that that actually happened to me and I was never in a position where I could do anything about it, you know. Did it impact your journey to motherhood? Do you feel like it changed the kind of mother that you intended to be, having to go through all that trauma to get to that point? I don't know. I mean, maybe it impacted the first few weeks because, you know, this doctor had told me that I was a poor excuse of a woman, that, you know, thousands of women give birth all over the world, you know, and my problems are no problems and, you know, I needed to get my shit together or otherwise I was going to be, you know, like in a whole lot of trouble because I had a baby now and he shifted all that blame kind of onto me. I guess there was a sense of anxiety about being a parent and doing things right in the very beginning because I was questioning whether or not I was going to be up to the task of looking after my son. But, you know, that was just his way and his demeanour and I guess his power trip that he would make women feel like they were incapable. And like you said, thousands of women give birth to babies all over the world and they seem to cope. So... Yeah, he was just not a very nice man and I was just really unlucky to have been crossing his path. Mm. So he has been found guilty and convicted in recent years over what he's done to many women. Does that give you a sense of justice or do you feel angry that he was allowed to continue on and keep doing that to women? I'm really disappointed and, yeah, I guess angry for the other ladies that suffered at his hands. I guess, you know, going down to the South Coast and getting medical care at regional hospitals is really difficult. And having specialists that are willing to work in regional areas is really difficult for hospitals to find staff. So I guess when they found this obstetrician from Sydney that, you know, had had many years experience, they thought they'd hit the jackpot. And I think they didn't really check into his background because they were so excited that they'd actually got this obstetrician for the hospital. So a lot of those checks and balances that should have taken place didn't and he managed to have a job where he shouldn't have had a job. And a whole lot of women were put in a really vulnerable position because of bad decisions by the hospital. It really upset me when he got such a light sentence after he, well, they refer to him as the butcher of Bega because he took away the genitals of that lady that was widely reported in the press. And I think he only got two or three years for that. I'm not quite sure exactly on his sentence, but it was very, very small. And I think on appeal, he actually got out of jail. So in terms of him paying for what he did, I don't think he really gave back to society what he took. If there's something that you could impart to young mothers now who are seeking out the services of an obstetrician, I mean, from my perspective, from what you've shared with us today, it's really trust your gut yeah. when it's telling you something's not right. But what message would you have wanted to give young Jane as she walked into that office that first time? 
I just wish that, you know, when you fall pregnant, the you know, you have mother's groups and stuff afterwards where all women sit together and talk about their experiences and stuff. Really, before you have a baby, all you have is birthing class where you go in and learn breathing exercises and stuff like that. And that's really probably your first foray into a community of women that are having babies. But there's not much else around for women that are pregnant where they could meet and have questions met and have a forum where they can talk to medical professionals before they have their baby because really that conversation is held individually with the gynecologist that they've chosen to have their baby with. So those conversations, if you were sitting in a group talking with each other, you would hear other people's stories and probably question, well, hang on, that's not happening with me. Is that right? Or should I be asking this question? Or, you know, I think when you start hearing stories, you realise what's normal and what's not normal. And I think for girls now, I mean, they've got the internet, you can Google a doctor, you can leave reviews on a doctor, you can do quite a bit of research on your own before you actually end up in a doctor's surgery and putting yourself in someone's care. So I think the options for younger women now are a lot better when it comes to putting yourself in the care of a specialist. But I think We've got a long way to go when it comes to making sure that if things go wrong, and they will go wrong, they always do, that we deal with that in a respectful and an honest way. Yeah, women just need to feel more empowered. Just finally, how's Liam going today? (laughs) He's good. Yeah, that little baby is now a fully grown man and he's very kind and he's very sensitive and he's the oldest of four children. So, you know... My bad birthing experience didn't stop me from going back and having another three babies. But, yeah, cautionary tale, I guess, do your research. And, you know, if it's your first baby, that research is even more important. Thank you so much to Jane for sharing her story. It is an incredibly brave and sometimes unsettling thing to do to revisit a traumatic time in your life. But Jane hopes that in telling her story, she empowers other women to speak openly about their experiences or concerns and to feel confident in speaking up when something just isn't right. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Claire Murphy, with audio design by Scott Stronich and guest booking by Cassie Merritt. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.